I've entitled the message today, Where is the Snake? Where is the Snake? If you have your Bibles, uh, Brother Gabriel took us through our scripture lesson this morning. Go back to John chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. John chapter 3, verse 14. Brother Aaron and his wife went over to visit their daughter this year. They went to Italy, and uh, the daughter came over from Spain. I understand they had a great time. God bless you. Glad you came back in one piece and that you didn't have to get on one of those airlines. They had to ground. We're thankful to see you again. God bless you. John chapter 3, beginning with what verse? Verse 14. If you have it, just say amen. All right. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be what? Lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. While Andy Stanley was in college, another student that he had met named Dave came home with him for a winter break. Unknown to Andy's parents, Dr. Charles and Anna Stanley, was that Dave brought an extra large suitcase with him. And what they did not know was that Dave had in this extra large suitcase a 40-pound python named Squeeze. If you didn't know what a python is, it's a snake. And uh, some people like snakes, and some people dislike snakes. All those that like snakes, let me see your hand. Raise it up. All right, I see a... Okay, I see a couple of hands of people that I know. I will not shake that hand. <laughs> see, to me, the only good snake is a dead snake. Now, that's me. Now, I know you're not supposed to go around killing the reptiles because they have a function and so on and so forth. But uh, he brought home uh, to, 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 well, on his visit, Squeeze. And Andy Stanley never really liked snakes, but Dave told him that he had nowhere to keep it during the spring break and that he would take care of it. Andy cringed and said, okay. Then it happened. Dave had unlocked that large suitcase. So Aaron, when uh, your daughter brings home uh, someone from college, with an extra large suitcase, ask what's in it first. He unlocked the suitcase, walked out the room, and uh, went upstairs for dinner. And by the time he came back down, Squeeze was nowhere in sight. They all carefully searched the house right up until about midnight. And they checked all the heating vents, the laundry basket, the bathroom, and couldn't find him. Well, the Stanleys thought that Squeeze might have found a nice warm spot next to the furnace. And with that, they decided to go to bed because they were tired. But where was the snake? See, I, I don't know about you. Somebody bring a snake to my house? And then you can't find him. I'm in a hotel that night. <laughs> See ya. I'm out of there. Well, while ancient Israel was wandering in the wilderness, they said at one point, very rebellious, very cantankerous, uh, the Israelites remind me sometimes of some people that I know. They're just very difficult all of the time. So they get out in the wilderness, and they said, why did you bring us from Egypt to die in this wilderness? And there is no food and no water, and our souls are disgusted with this 
insubstantial food. They slandered the food which was graciously provided to them at no effort of their own. They were half starved, they were exhausted, and there was no promise to the promised land at all. And almost all had buried loved ones along the way. Uh, Miriam, the sister of Moses, died in the wilderness of Zin. And his brother Aaron, who uh, was along with him, died on Mount Hor. And now they were without water, and the people began to become discouraged. And, and, and their unbelief, and in their unbelief, they murmured against Moses and against God for bringing them into the wilderness. The same wilderness that they could have been out of, they were in because of their sins. It's interesting how God will bless you and then you'll be mad with God for blessing you because you thought the blessing wasn't exactly the way you wanted it to be. But many times, your setback is a set up for God to bless you and for you to move off of dead center. Well, the Bible calls them fiery serpents. And these serpents were released against the Israelites. It wasn't so much that God sent the serpents. The serpents were already in the wilderness. It's just that God closed the serpents' mouths. And it wasn't like, well, God sent. No, the snakes were already there. But God was just protecting his people. This time, instead of giving them a blessing, God sent them a curse. And all around, <clears throat> as the people were looking, there were snakes everywhere. Again, how many of you like snakes? Let me see your hand. I see fewer hands go up this time. <laughs> let, I, let me check this out. How many of you like snakes? All right. Now, would you like it if all of a sudden, everywhere you were about to step, there was a poisonous snake? And that if the snake bit you, it was so uh, um, uh, noxious and poisonous that it burned like fire. Poisonous serpents. And, 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 and the garden, they weren't the garden variety snake. I, I've seen, we used to play with little brown snakes. How many of you remember that? You remember that? Yeah, little brown snakes. I, I saw a black snake in my yard one time. This was when I was living back in Pennsylvania. He went one way, I went the other way. Don't like snakes. And I don't like anything about a snake. I don't care if they eat uh, rodents or, or mice. I just don't like snakes. And, and so what happened was uh, the children were bitten. <clears throat> the parents, men, women, <clears throat> everyone that was there <clears throat> was being bitten by a snake just about. So the people cried to Moses. And they said, we have sinned because we have spoken against God and we have spoken against you. Pray that God will take the serpents from us. And so Moses prayed to God and God told Moses to get busy and fashion a bronze serpent like the ones that had bitten the people, put it on a pole and lift it up. And when they lift it up, all you had to do was look at it and live. It's an old story, but uh, I want to add a familiar twist to that. There were some people, inspiration tells us, that refused to look. They refused to look after they had been bitten. And I could see Moses going around to all the different courts. Look at the snake on the pole. Look at the snake. But some people were so honorary and disagreeable, hard-headed and obnoxious that they refused to look 
And inspiration says they refused to look and they died. God uses the serpent symbolism for healing. Uh, the, the, it, was, it was among Semitic people, they associated serpents with healing, so God used this symbol. Snakes were thought to have regenerative powers and healing powers because they would shed their skin. The only thing I want to see is when the snake sheds his skin, one, I don't want to be around, and two, wherever he goes after leaving that skin, I'm not going after him. God, there are two things that I learned. One was, God is not someone to be trifled with. I don't make jokes about God. I don't laugh about God. I don't use God's name in vain. Uh, and, and, and certainly, I don't say things like, if I'm not telling the truth, may God strike me dead. Mm-mm. No, I, I'm, I'm not going to trifle with God like that. But God is not a God to be trifled with. And venomous serpents that were sent against the Israelites, God just simply removed the protection that he had over the Israelites, and snakes did what snakes do, and that is they will bite if you're in their territory. But the second thing is, that the same serpents that God used to bite the Israelites, he had one made like a serpent, and you had to look at it, and you could heal. Now, the second thing is that the Israelites had to exercise faith in the offer. The Bible says that God has given to every man a measure of faith. So we all have some faith. So, Lord, I believe, but help mine unbelief. I will get to a certain point where it's difficult for me to conceive how in this situation God will step in and save me or provide for me. If he has a thousand ways to do what we only think that there's one way, God is more than able to take care of our needs in time of trouble. God is quick to answer our prayers when we call on him, we have to exercise a little faith. I don't know if I told you this before, but I'm going to tell it again. My wife was in the hospital. Our son was an infant. <clears throat> I had to go to camp meeting, so I had to leave her in the hospital and take the baby with me. Got to camp meeting, stayed for a few days, had to go back and see about my wife. <clears throat> the car broke down on the highway. Did I tell you this before? Well, I'm going to tell it again anyway. So the car breaks down on the road. I had enough strength to pull over to the side. And I said, okay, what must I do? So I took off my T-shirt and hung it out the window. You know, the white symbol of, you know, help, rescue. Everybody kept passing me. So then I said, well, what must I do? And the thought came, well, shake it a little bit. So I'm shaking it a little bit. Now, I was shaking a long time because the sun started to kind of go down a little bit. Here I am with this baby in the back, and he's asleep. The car is not working. I need help. I'm trying to signal somebody on the highway to help me. Then the Lord said, you are not desperate enough to get off this road. I grabbed that T-shirt and started shaking it with everything I had. Now, mind you, before I left camp meeting, the car broke down in the parking lot, and a big truck pulled up and jumped me. And I got out on the road, but the battery died. Now, I'm shaking with all my might, Brother Aaron. I'm desperate now. Sun going down. It's getting dark. It's getting cold. And I'm trying to exercise my faith. Finally, 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 somebody pulled over to help me. It was a little tiny beat-up Volkswagen. I said, Lord, Lord, Jesus, 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 keep me near the cross. A truck tried to jump me and, and did so, but here comes an old beat-up Volkswagen. But you don't get, look the gift horse in the mouth. 
And the man that got out, he said, what can I do? He said, I, I think I need a jump. I said, but I don't need, I don't have jumper cables. He said, don't worry, I got jumper cables. And this old beat up Volkswagen. And if you know where the battery is on the Volkswagen, come on now, somebody knows. Where is the bad battery located in the old Volkswagen? This is like in the passenger side of the front seat. Yeah, or something like that. All I know was he had a whole lot of junk in the car. He pulled that out. Then he pulled the seat out, and there was the battery. I said, Lord, now, you know, the truck got me started. I got an old Volkswagen here, and somebody, they don't know me. I don't know them. He hooked it up. Car turned over. I said, my brother. Now he's my brother. <laughs> my brother, can I make a donation in your cause? <laughs> he said, no, I don't want your money. He said, just take the baby, get off the road, and make sure that when you get back, you get the battery recharged. I'm stunned because my faith was not enough to believe that a beat up Volkswagen should save me. I'm stunned because I have no jumper cables and here the man is pulling out all the junk, including battery cables. I'm stunned because what used to get me started was that truck that pulled up that got me jumped. But a little guy in a Volkswagen, all beat up, trash in the car, but jumper cables and a battery, and got me started on the road. God is good and worthy to be praised. Somebody ought to say amen to that. See, the way that you think that God is going to come is not always the way that he's going to come and fix your situation. And the Israelites didn't think that a snake, a bronze snake lifted on a pole was going to do the job, but it's all that was necessary. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so much the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This symbolism of the snake goes all the way back with the Semitic people, goes back to ancient Egypt, the Pharaoh. Go back and look at it. The Pharaoh, his headdress, his crown piece, had a snake on the front of it, which said he was all-powerful, he had the power to heal, and he was immune from harm. They understood the power of the serpent. When Moses was confronted with Pharaoh and his magicians, and they threw down their rods and became snakes, Moses threw down his rod, became a snake also, but it ate up their snakes. God knows how to use the symbolism to reach his people. But now, fast forward. When Nicodemus came to visit Jesus at night, he approached him and he said, Rabbi, which means you're a teacher, I'm a teacher. But Jesus said, uh, cut to the chase real fast, he said, you need to be born again. He wanted to flatter Jesus by saying, well, you know, you're a rabbi, I'm a rabbi, you're a teacher, I'm a teacher. You know, but he's trying to find the answer to, to life and eternal life. And uh, finally, Jesus said, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus said, why can I be born when I'm old? He understood what the process was necessary. So finally, Jesus just really cut to the chase. He said, listen, I'm more than a teacher. I am more than a healer. I am one who was with God, who is God, who in the beginning made all things. To prove to you I am who I say I am, when you see me lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, when you see me, Jesus, son of Joseph, raised in Nazareth, Son of Mary, when you see me lifted up and you believe, I'm going to draw you into me. That's what it means to be drawn into Jesus. Not just up by Jesus, but when Jesus grabs hold of you, he brings you into himself. He in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
The bronze serpent in the wilderness was a foreshadowing of Christ on the cross, dying to save us from eternal death. But it is up to us to look. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor. I said, touch your neighbor and say, neighbor. Now, if you're sitting by somebody you don't like, you need prayer real fast. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor. You got to look. Come on, say, you got to look to Jesus to be saved. You got to look. It is the look of faith that will save you when you look to Jesus. The bronze serpent in the wilderness was a foreshadowing of Christ on the cross. But the question today is, whatever happened to the snake? When God saved the people of Israel from the fiery serpents, they held on to the bronze serpent long after the, all the other snakes had slithered away. And in fact, they held on to so long after Moses had died, long after Joshua had led them into the promised land, long after Solomon built his temple, they held on to it and would not let it go for 700 years. But then the Bible says, when Hezekiah became king in Judah, he did something. Go now to 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 4. What book, everybody? 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 4. 2 Kings 18 and we're looking at verse 4. What book, everybody? 2 Kings, we're looking at chapter 18 and what verse? Verse 4. 2 Kings 18, verse 4. He removed the high places. That's all of the groves and the mountains and so forth where uh, the people practice licentious worship. And break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and it became unto them uh, a wonderful, well, let me put it this way. It was a good snake that went bad. <laughs> a good snake gone bad. Now, I already told you. Good snake to me is a dead snake, as long as it's out of my way. A good snake that had gone bad. There it is. A godly king broke in pieces the very object that had meant life to Israel in the wilderness. And by doing this, Hezekiah, Hezekiah did what was right and pleasing to the Lord. I, I think we need to ask the question, do we know of anything that has become an object of worship in our lives other than God. Okay, since you don't know, God sent me here to tell you. God did not intend for his people to worship that snake. They had become idolaters. And a good thing, and, 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 and idolatry is when a good thing becomes a supreme thing. Idols are terrible masters. They, de they, they demand our love, affections, our thoughts, our times, our dreams, and our desires, but they never satisfy. They never deliver as promised, and idols always leave us in a state of discontentment. The greatest sin in the Bible, by far, is the sin of idolatry. Idolatry is the main reason why God rebuked and judged the nations of Israel. And many Christians are caught up in idolatry today. An idol is any person, object, or activity you give a higher priority to in your life than your relationship with God. Let me say it again. An idol is any person, object, or activity you give a higher priority in your life than a relationship with God. An idol can be your home, your money, movies, 
politics, politics. And, and some of us, we, we, we idolize this whole political scene that's going on. This too shall pass. Popularity, influence, success, a job, a vehicle, a relationship, even sex or your family can be an idol. An idol can be putting people and things ahead of praying and before God. An idol can be a pet, a computer, or what you see on a computer. An idol can be drugs, alcohol, any sin, a drug. An idol can be vegetarianism or veganism. People always like to talk, I, I never had a piece of flesh in my mouth for years. No, you haven't had flesh in your mouth, but you eat people. You're a vegan cannibal. <laughs> and that can be the work you do for the Lord, and it consumes more of your time. What is your idol? The things that we hold on to, we can also hold and, and turn them into symbols of worship. I remember my nephew put me in my place one time. I was trying to wax elegant. My brother came to visit with their two sons at the time, and, and the oldest was about five. And he saw a Bible on my bed, and when he walked by, he said, uh, whose book is that? So I wanted to, Sister Vera, I wanted to wax elegant, Brother Vera, I wanted to. So I said, that's Jesus' book. He said, well, if it's Jesus' book, why don't you give it back to him? And, you know, we make idols of our Bibles, you know, the ones that are printed in gold and red for the words of Jesus and gold leaf and leather and all like that. But even the Bible can become an idol if you don't get into it and recognize the worship of God. I say we need him every hour and every day of the hour. Amen? I thank God for this text in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Because it says, if, when you see the Son of Man lifted up, then you'll know exactly who I am. We're all guilty of the idol of celebrated people, celebrities. We are even guilty of lifting up preachers higher than we should be lifted up. Respected, but only God is lifted up. We idolize personal prosperity. And we think that because professionally or or, or, or because of our income, that because we are blessed, we are honored of God, and we idolize that. But the Bible says the poor you have with you always, always. So regardless of how prosperous you may become, if you don't help people and view them as your brother because, or your sister because they have less, perhaps you have made an idol of your income. As a people, the Israelites worship all kind of objects but refused to acknowledge God. And as a result, they eventually were removed from the promised land, carried off to a foreign ca a country as captive. And, and this never would have happened if they had worshipped God alone. By being lifted up on the cross and dying on that cross, Nicodemus finally got it. He finally recognized that on the day that Jesus died, that truly he was who he said he was, the Son of God. And by resurrecting on the third day, early Sunday morning, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is the one that we should be honoring and lifting up. And even Nicodemus, when Jesus died, begged for his body. Took him to his own brand new grave. And it usually takes about 20, 25 pounds to wrap the bodies in, 
Nicodemus had 100 pounds of spices and aloes to wrap Jesus. Not a quarter of the amount, but all 100 pounds to honor the crucified Savior. Well, I want to close. There is an altitude at which snakes do not live. It is called the snake line. And above certain altitudes, because snakes are cold-blooded, they don't generate their own heat. They cannot live above the snake line. Back in the days of the early settlements of this country, in the Appalachian Mountains, when people were given land or they staked out their claims for land, they always wanted to have their homes built above the snake line. Because back in those days when a snake bit you, especially a poisonous snake, it was like a death sentence. Jesus has provided us with a snake line. <laughs> and by looking to Jesus and living with him in heavenly places, even while on earth, he provides us with a snake line where being bitten by a snake, even the serpent of the old devil cannot take us out because we're above the snake line. Nervous emotions like fear and anger and worry and jealousy and resentment and self-pity are emotional poisons given to us by snake bite. But they cannot live above God's snake line. Emotional poisons do not exist when there is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. Why? Because they are above the line where a snake can bite us. Can I take it a little bit further? I said, can I take it a little bit further? Can I go slightly deeper? In folklore, the stones made of jasper were considered antidotes to keep you from being bitten by snakes. If you had a jasper stone on you, it was going to ward off the ability for snakes to bite you. In the place where Jesus has promised he's gone to prepare a place for us. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may also be also. The walls of the city, bright and fair, the home, the new Jerusalem, the walls are made of jasper which symbolizes heaven and glory above the snake line. And the old serpent, the devil, can no longer bite us and take our lives. But if we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, he is the antidote for the poison of sin. And being the antidote, and living with Christ for a thousand years in the city bright and fair means that we are immune from the serpent, the old devil, because we are above the snake line. Two things as a close. Where is the snake 
if there is a snake line? I'm glad you asked that question because I stopped by here today to give you two answers. One, Nahum chapter 1 and verse 9. What book did I say, everybody? Nahum chapter 1 and verse 9. You can jot this down. Nahum 1, 9. The Bible says, affliction shall not arise a second time. When God creates a new heaven and a new earth, sin and all of its poisonous venom from the old serpent, the devil, will not arise a second time. In the Lord, good. Worthy to be praised. Affliction shall not arise a second time. And in Malachi, as I close, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 3. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 3, the last book in the Old Testament, chapter 4 and verse 3. For they, meaning the wicked, shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. Where is the snake? <laughs> Never to rise again. Where is the snake? Ashes under the soles of your feet. There's a song and phraseology and the lyrics. Up where we belong says, love lift us up where we belong. Where the eagles cry on a mountain high. Love lift us up where we belong, far from the world we know, up where the clear winds blow. Eternally separated from the snake. Eternally in the presence of of the Lord where affliction shall not arise a second time above the snake line. How many would like to live above the snake line today? Let me see your hand. Would you like to live above the snake line? Come on, stand to your feet if you want to live above the snake line. God is calling us up to something high. And you have to understand that. It's, The only thing that you had to do was an act by faith, and that was to look. He didn't ask you about keeping the commandments. Now, they're good to keep, but you can't keep them without looking first. Because Jesus must be in you to will, cause you to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's not something you can say, oh, well, I'll just do it. I'll just do it. No, you, you, you don't have the power to do it. Got too many idols. Got too many things to distract you from doing right. We don't have a whole lot of do right in us to start with. Born in sin and shapen in iniquity, bitten by the snake even while we were in our mother's womb, already prescribed to die an untimely death because of the poison of sin. Yet if we will but look, Look and live. My brother live. Look to Jesus now and live. It's recorded in his book. Hallelujah. And it's only that we look and live. Will you look today? Would you give God a chance today to cast down every idol, cast out every foe? Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Are you serious? Are you serious? Come on and meet me in the front. Let me pray with you that all that we see is above that snake line, that all that where we live is above the snake line, that all that what we do is above the snake line, and the immunity from sin is the precious blood of Jesus. Come on, let me pray with you before we go.
The Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can have all of the affirmations. You can have all of the Bible text. You could even have a great experience in the Lord. But if you are not aware of the deceitfulness of sin and the deceitfulness of our hearts, it's easy to go down and out real fast. Come on, press close to the steps. Some of you are really struggling with some things that will take you out. And I'm not talking about take you out to dinner. It'll take you out quick, fast, and in a hurry. The deceitfulness of sin says, yeah, it's not, not that bad. No, it's worse than what you think it is. It's like you're going to uh, your doctor, and the doctor prescribes an x-ray, but the x-ray is not clear enough to then going to prescribe an MRI or a CAT scan. Got to look a little deeper. You look a little deeper, you find out, oh, there's something there. Something there that will kill you. And God calls us to look. That's what happened to Nicodemus. When he saw Jesus hanging on the cross, everything that Jesus told him came back to him. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. But by being lifted up and looking to him, the answer was there for the antidote of the poison of sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me pure again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we stand today because we have been victimized by the poison serpent of the devil. It has affected our hearts. Our hearts beat with a different rhythm because we have been poisoned by sin. It has affected uh, even how we look at other people. And so you said that you would perform heart surgery on those who had hearts that were messed up. I will take away the heart of stone, he tells us in the Old Testament. I will give you a heart of flesh. So, God, we need you to perform surgery as well as we need the antidote for the power and the presence of sin in our lives. We've taken a stand today and we've come forward and said, I need to live above this snake line. I'm tired of being bitten by the poison of sin and taking directions that don't lead me to the cross where I can see Jesus lifted up and it's by his precious blood and that we are cleansed and covered from our sins. By his stripes we are healed and we need, oh God, the application by faith of just looking to Jesus. Bless the families that are standing here, men, women, children, girls, and boys. And bless us, O oh God, that one day we'll live within the jasper walls, never to be affected by sin or its presence or its power. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Let the church say, Amen.